came back to the elms the elms that you saw earlier in the video we did the audio tour here now we're doing the um, servants of life tour behind the scenes kind of thing where they take you into the cellar and other parts of the house and up to where the servants lived on the fourth floor so um, that's what we're doing now back in the day so they tore those down and built this big wall around here this is 13 and a half acres now it's one of the largest lots on this whole street it's 60,000 square feet 48 rooms uh, two stories you see the foundations granite and the walls are Indiana limestone and uh, one of the unique features of this house that most people don't notice is that the front of the house actually has three front doors there's no house like it in the whole city and the reason for the three front doors was back in those days they wanted to be able to unload three carriages at the same time oh. I'm sure some of you have that problem when you have a big party <laughs> in your place right but that's what they did so when this house opened it opened in August of 1901 they had 150 carriages pull up in this front yard here 1901 uh, when the house was completed so everything was still with horses and so on and in the back of the property we do have a carriage house and a garage site next to each other in the back. so they've come in this way let's, let's follow them with them so here we are now. This is the third floor. This will be the servants' quarters. Bourbons don't come up here. Only the butler and the housekeeper come up just once in a while to check. And they usually use one of these rooms here for an office. But um, this is a very unique thing. <laughs> this is what's interesting about it. This is, think about 1901. There's 16 individual rooms. Only single people could live here. If you got married, you had to move out. There are men and women. And there's no supervision other than themselves. Okay? So it's like Columbia University about 1968. <laughs> but 68 years before that. It's very, it's very strange. How it worked, we've looked for you know, some sort of scandal or nothing. We can't find anything. If you come up with something, tell us, please. We just think there's got to be something up there. I'm joking. So, anyways, uh, this is where they would live. So there's 16 individual rooms, three shared baths. And they worked that out somehow. We don't know how they worked either. But. So let's walk down here. I'll show you how they communicated, and then we're going to take a look at some of the rooms. This is where they had this little plug. Hundred year old glass block floor. Whoa. <laughs> so this is, uh, again, we have. Well, basically, is a so they did have this, and this is called an enunciator. The enunciator connects all the buttons that you see around the house, and there's about uh, 90 of them, 28 stations. And so when the Berwins, basically the idea was the Berwins could get service no matter where they were in the house, because these buttons are everywhere. So they push a button, it would ring a bell on the top, and, one, and the different bells indicated the floor. And then it would drop a white disc into one of these rectangles indicating the location. So when the servants heard the bell and they were on call 24-7, they come out and they would see where it was and go down to take care of whatever it was that the servants needed. And it could be anything. It could be picking up dishes or something, but it could be something like taking an invitation across the street or taking something downtown or going down to the docks to pick up something. Many times it was Mr. Burwell they were picking up because he actually didn't stay here during the week. He only came up on the weekends. So they would pick him up uh, Saturday night. Actually, Saturday morning at the uh, docks. Closets were not typical in the, those days. They would have just a bunch of hooks on the wall for the clothing. This is actually a walk-in closet. So um, what we have here is a census of the house down in New York City, which is this house right here. This is the, I told you, this is little tiny 40,000 square foot. Uh, it's now a townhouse. I was told the other day that half of it sold about a year or so ago for something like $25 million, oh half of it, if you can imagine that. And as I mentioned, right across the street here is Central Park. So they're right across from Central Park. This is East 64th Street, this is Fifth Avenue. And um, I'll tell you a little more about that. So this will list the people that uh, worked for the borough. No, this is, is the census from 1915, it's a few years after the house opens. This is some of the people living in the house in New York. And so we have the names, obviously, and then the birthplaces. This is always interesting because it kind of follows the immigration patterns of the day. So we have England, Ireland, Scotland, Ireland, and, you know, you can see mostly England and Ireland. And we know that the potato famine was 1840 in Ireland. So from 1840 to about 1920, we have this huge immigration uh, and really a migration of uh, English and Irish to the United States. Yeah, so you see the, yeah, you see the title, butler, chef, footman, 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 useful man. 
Mm. Now, yesterday a woman said she'd like to meet. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that is? It's uh, yeah, handy handy man. Man. That's what we thought, like a handyman or whatever. Let me give you the culture of the day. The culture of the day is if you come in the front door, the door is opened by a man. Oh. Sit in the dining room, table brings a plate of food, it's a man. Mm -hmm. So the men are visible, the women are invisible. That's the culture of the day. You don't see the women. They're in the kitchen, they're in the laundry. They're in uh, other things, but not like housekeeping. The uh, useful man is kind of in the middle. He, we don't see him either. He's what's actually called an underfootman. He's actually a scut man or a cleanup guy, a guy that helps the footman cleaning probably the dirtiest jobs that there were in the house. But we notice 10 years later that job is not part of the, the list here. So it may have been something that was kind of evolving out and probably was not needed after a while. Uh, then we have our maids and kitchen maids and so on. Ten years later, we look at the list and everybody's gone except for the butler. He's still here. Uh, the birthplaces have changed quite a bit too, including people born in the United States. So you can see 1925, we know that that's post-World War I. We know that mass immigration in the United States has stopped because mass immigration in the United States stops in the 20s. And for 40 years, we don't have any mass immigration. We don't know, we've, we've basically closed the borders for 40 years. Most people don't know that, but that's what happened. So there's a lack of people coming in looking for entry-level jobs. Now we're going to start depending on other people and also people from other countries. So this, again, follows the immigration patterns to the United States. Most of the jobs are the same. And here's another reason there's a big turnover, is that as they made money, they became mobile, much like you do when you, when you have more money you're able to take other opportunities. They also took care of the greenhouses. We grew a lot of not only flowers here, but we also grew fruits and vegetables in the greenhouses. Um, in the winter, the indoor staff goes back to New York with Mrs. Berwin. The outdoor staff stays here, but not in the house. They stay over the carriage house and garages in the back, where there's a living room, there's bedrooms for everybody, there's a kitchen, there's a dining room, and that sort of thing. Um, and the indoor staff then goes back to the other house. And again, if they were married, they didn't live in the house. In fact, the butler, who worked for them for decades, Never spent one night in this house. Huh. In Newport, he lived in on Spring Street, right behind us, 503 Spring Street, which is right behind the property. In New York, he lived down East 64th Street, which was right around the corner from the, the main house there. So, interesting how they did that. Jeez. Giant water cistern. What do you call it? Cistern? What is it? Tank? I don't even know. Water tanks on the top floor. Jeez, it's amazing. Bathroom they shared. So this is actually the sister of somebody. This is uh, Nellie. Pike, all the metal work and so on. The slate, the flooring and stuff is all designed to stop. And so far we've never had one thing. All right, let's go. Let's walk around the corner. I'm going to show you our backyard here. It's called the Newport Pell Bridge. It was completed in 1969, 235 feet at the center span to allow aircraft carriers into the port because we used to be a naval port up uh, the bay here. Right in front of that is Gota Island, which is where the torpedo factory was located. Now it's the home of Gurney's uh, Hotel and Resort and also the home of the Newport Yacht Club. Hmm. Uh, straight across from us is Fort Adams. I mentioned earlier this was built in the 1800s. It's the largest coastal port in the United States. And it's the home of the Newport Jazz Festival, Newport Folk Festival each year. And right next to that is Sail Newport, which uh, teaches sailing to uh, thousands of kids every year here in the Bay. Uh, the little, the big dock sticking out there is the Ida Lewis Yacht Club. And then at the head of the uh, dock is the uh, New York Yacht Club headquarters. And then you see our backyard here. Let's, and then behind the trees you'll see two uh, gazebos or tea houses. There's one on the left and one on the right behind the four trees there. And this is where uh, Mrs. Berwin used to take her friends. They played uh, cards and they and they played mahjong. That was a big game back in those days. I uh, did the same thing, played cards and mahjong with her friends. But she also invited kids from the neighborhood. Hmm. So we take them out to the tea house and have milk and cookies with them. And that, by the way, that's a good strategy if you want to be loved in your neighborhood. <laughs> When the cars came in, Julia, uh, turns out, loved to drive. Unfortunately, was not a good driver. So uh, Mr. Berwin hired a uh, chauffeur for it. His name was uh, Frank Morgan. And Frank Morgan was 
recommended as an excellent driver, except that nobody told us that uh, he didn't know how to back up the car. So after a couple of fenders were lost, uh, Mr. Bruin says, I'm going to fix that. He was an engineer, you know. So he put a turntable on the floor of the uh, garage oh, no <laughs> so that he could pull in and literally push a button, it's electric, and turn the car around 180 degrees and drive straight out. Imagine these with 10 watt bulbs. So, anyways, this was the laundry room. There was five of these big sinks. There was no May tag in those days. <laughs> Everything done by hand. They used these wash boards you see over here and these agitators. These would go into the sink to wash the clothes. They'd be wrung out either by hand or using these little simple wringers you see behind you. And then everything had to be dried, so they couldn't hang the clothes outside because it is Bellevue Avenue. It is important. So, this room here was a drying room. This is a huge room. It's probably about uh, 400 square feet of drying. It was all clothes lines, and it was heated by one of the furnaces in the sub basement. So in the summer, this would be going full time, drying clothes, the clothes would be dry, brought out here. Everything was ironed by hand using these hand irons. They were heated up on coal stoves, and then the clothes would be folded and taken back to the person they belonged to. But because the women had these fancy gowns and so on with very delicate fabrics, fancy buttons, mother of pearl, all that kind of thing, before they washed any of the gowns, they cut all the buttons off. <laughs> Then they washed them, wrung them out, dried them, ironed them, and then took them up to the sewing room on the second floor. This is a dedicated space just for sewing buttons on. The sew basement. Just hang on to the rear. Oh, no. Come in here. shutters for the house stored down here. And you'll see the brick walls above you go clear. This is what they look like. They, they look so simple, but this is actually Roman Empire technology. This is how they built the house. Remember we went to the trap door out there? The trap door in the street yesterday? That's where that goes. There's definitely ghosts in, in this basement. You would also take the ashes from the furnaces and the fireplaces. Well, originally it was down here in the basement, and then I met him to That was a backup in the beginning because the electric system was Crazy, man. came off the tracks a couple times. <laughs> What's the, where they move it out of the way, you know, like, yeah, yeah let's, all right, let's get this one out of the way. Old days, uh, mostly Louis Vuitton. If you know anything about Louis Vuitton, it's very collectible, so it's 25,000 inches concocted here. Yeah. 
We're going to go right to the and these are their original boxes? Did, uh, uh, or the are they... The BJP is Mr. Berwin's. Uh, a number of these are uh, actually donations of some of our members and some are from like our... The ones out in the hallway, are those just reproductions or are those actual... Those are their oh, boxes. Those are, those are legit. Yeah, those are originals. Oh my gosh, they're so expensive. Yeah. This is uh, pretty frigid air, you know, uh, 1901. There's no ice making going on. So the way that they were able to have ice, and this room would have been filled up with ice by February of the year. When they opened the house on July 1st, they would come in and they would work off of the ice that was left. And apparently there's quite a bit of it was left because it's so well insulated here. And then there's a drain in the floor in the event that there was some drainage. Everything around this room, though, is designed to support the kitchen, which is about 25 feet away. So behind here would have been root vegetables stored underneath the back terrace. Nice, cool storage space back here. So there would be things like potatoes, carrots, onions, that sort of thing. And then straight through these doors is how they would access those uh, vegetables. And there's also two doors. If you look through those, the window, you see two doors straight ahead. Yeah. That's the original wine cellar for the house. And it's actually underground. It's dug into the ground back there. We're hoping to renovate that so you can go back in that area as well. We haven't done that yet, but that's coming. And they're all made out of the same material, which is oak. And this is, believe it or not, standard worldwide. Anywhere you go in the world, you'll see these oak boxes and they're, they're, how they kept their ice. But there's still many places, by the way, in the world that are still using them. They're still using ice because they don't have a Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely poop. Vinny's picking up goose poop. Throwing it at us. <laughs> Vinny, pick up another piece of goose poop. <laughs> Throw it at Kristen. <laughs> That's a big one. It's in your hair. No, oh, it's not it's in your hair. In the hood. No, it's not in your hair. It not in your hair. Ew, it's in the hood. It's not in the hood. It's in the hood.